This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk about the 10th episode in Season 2 of The Bad Batch. The episode is titled Retrieval. We have got two guests chatting with all of us to discuss this incredible... Well, I don't know if incredible is quite the word, but we do have a lot to say about the episode. First, we're going to bring in Mason Z. Mason Zare, how are you, buddy? Good. I just got my Super Bowl t-shirt in the mail today of the Chiefs. So life is good. <laughs> I said, you don't know how lucky you are just to be able not only to get that shirt, but man, what I wouldn't give to have a Chicago Bears shirt that said Super Bowl champs. That wasn't from full of moths. Yeah. All right. Well, this guy is not full of moss. He's full of energy <laughs> and insights. You know him from the Rebel Base Card podcast. This is Greg McLaughlin. Greg, welcome back to the show. Dan and Mason, it is so nice to uh, be on with you both tonight. Nice to see you again on this, uh, I guess uh, we're celebrating Ash Wednesday. So yes, good on indeed. everybody. Yes, indeed we are. Well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, Mason, we'll start with you. Give me a one word to describe the episode and overall thoughts on it. Greed read seems like seems apt tell me why you mm. picked that one or no actually don't tell me that tell me your overall thoughts on the episode one word mako <laughs> <laughs> all right what a deliciously ambiguous start to this greg what about you one word to describe the episode and overall thoughts boy i would say the, the word i would say is inevitable because i think we are moving the bad batch albeit a little slowly to a conclusion, I think we know what's going to happen with them. Uh, hmm. But I would say I was very satisfied with the episode. And then the second one, you know, a lot of times when you're watching and you, you happen to watch on your mobile phone, I think you miss a lot. And so when you get a chance to see it again on the big screen and you're catching not only the music, the, the video, but uh, a couple of subtle things I missed the first time through is so much better. So uh, second time, even even better than the first. Right on. I would agree with that. My word is infuriating. I cannot stand Mako. He is so like there are times I even can't watch him that that sequence where he's eating. Oh, he just drives me crazy. The episode overall, I think uh, I kind of see it as two parts. Um, I think the first half is really just kind of a setup. The second half is the payoff. And when they actually get uh, the Bad Batch arrives and meets Benny and it, it has a very different tone than the opening sequence. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about it. Uh, I found it the episode to be frustrating, but purposefully frustrating. And I think that is a good storytelling. So let's kick it off with you, Greg. What are some, as you know, we don't really go through this one linearly. I would say, and I was, I was going to be very interested in Mason's reactions to what I thought was a huge Peter Pan, Captain Hook, Lost Boys vibe. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we've seen some of those Disney, you know, the, some of the Disney, some of the Indiana Jones, you know, kicks this, this one but you know something kept bugging me with with maka the whole time and i think at the end you know when you see sort of you know when you see the, the revolt as it were th that's when i saw the payoff and i saw i saw captain hook in, in in maka uh right there so that's just you know what i thought was kind of interesting but you know we come of it from maybe seeing you know peter pan seeing hook but i didn't i was kind of curious i didn't know if mason had seen either of those two movies, I mean, they're, they're not, you know, they're not young anymore, but I was just kind of curious if he, if he didn't, what kind of perspective he, he came from picking this up and what did you think if, if you got some of the same? Mace. Um, I think Benny admires Omega. Yes. I, I think Benny admires Omega a lot too. Do you agree with Greg that there's kind of a Peter Pan and Captain Hook thing going on here? Yes. Uh, Cause when you were a kid, you loved <laughs> Peter Pan. Loved it. You're still a kid, but a much younger version of yourself. Uh, tell Talk about the, the Peter Pan and, and Hook comparisons that Greg brought up. It was like Mako falling, but then Benny tries to help him up. But then Mako says, don't cross me again, boy. And that reminds and you of Captain Hook? Well, you've, you've even got the hand thing. Right, that Mako's got that that hand, which is of course like his own little version of a hook, mm. clearly. And there there is a vibe too of, well, whereas Hook 
is clearly out for himself. And then they're just kind of scared of it. They're just, uh, you know, pirates that don't seem to have any loyalties either way. Mako, it reminded me more of Charles Dickens or like Oliver Twist or something mm. like that. Uh, very Dickinsonian where, or, or like um, in the force awakens with Ray and on car plot. Uh, but I think, I think that Mako is much, much worse uh, be, because of, while there's a, a a bit of a rivalry there, uh, it's more about him controlling people through fear, through intimidation, and through this 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 false pretense of superiority. Uh, but Greg, I want to hear what you think about the Captain Hook thing. You know, it was interesting when I first saw Mockett and I saw that you know he was obviously he had the mechanical hand, but also he kind of walked with a limp. You know, he yes. was kind of walking oh. with the cane and had the droids. But, you know, when I first saw, you know, like his crew, which were mostly boys and and how he was really, you know, like first off, you know, he was not crazy at all about having the ship. He's like, you know, this is going to bring attention that I don't want. You know, we're going to have to get rid of it quietly. And then, you know, when you see him like gorging, it wasn't eating. It was gorging. Yes. You know, and and I kind of saw that he seemed very, you know, he was worried about like his control over, you know, he was very concerned with keeping that and very, you know, rationing out the food and so forth. And so, you know, that kind of started leading to be, me to believe that, you know what, he has a very precarious situation. It seems, you know, inevitable to them, you know, his, his crew that, you know, he's got this, like, you know, his thumb down on him, but it just seemed very fragile. And as it got closer, you're going you know, closer to the end. You're like, where's this going to go? Um, but then of course, you know, um, you know, Benny does, you know, sort of reveal it and, and turn the tables on him. But, um, it was just, it was fascinating to watch that, but I thought the payoff at the end was really nice. I mean, it was, it was really good. And I liked how that resolution came. I mean, not too many shots were fired. I mean, no, <laughs> except none. you know, Maka getting, you know, you know, losing his life, you know, falling to his death. But other than that, it was, you know, pretty low body count. I, lo- I love the the symbolism there of his artificial hand is what drops off because he's an artificial person and that that mm. very much leads to his downfall. He yeah his I I think you I think it's even given him more credit than he deserves. I don't think he thinks any further than um, that moment because the way he eats shows you what yes. kind of person that he is. You know, like you said, he's not eating; he's gorging. He's he's not even enjoying it. He's not even he's not even trying to be full. He's just having it because he can have it. It's like dragons. And Dungeons and Dragons that just lay in gold. They're not going to spend it. <laughs> they don't need it. They can have whatever they want, but they just want it because everybody else does it. And the way that he, when he feeds all of them, he says, well, I'm not going to let my people starve. He says, you're going to have to work a lot harder and longer for rations. So he gives them this little bowl of soup that they all have to take a spoon and just get. I mean, that's not enough to live on. And that just shows the how foolish he is. He doesn't see that the Marauder could bring him a ridiculous amount of riches. And he even knows that it's modified. So it's got to be some extra surplus there. And the fact that he doesn't see, if I don't feed these people, they will get weak. They won't be able to work. I won't be able to mine this MCM that I keep telling them is degraded, but it isn't. He just, not only is he greedy and slovenly, but he's an absolute fool. And I think that's what rankles me so much more. I, I don't like when people take advantage of people in a fictional world or not. And he really gets my goat. <laughs> uh, Mason, what would you like to bring up about this episode? Um, Benny turning on Omega, but then thinking about it as they're coming. Well, you think they're coming after he presses the button. So here's a question. So uh, that in that sequence, and they're working together. He 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 very much like you said. Ome- he looks up to Omega, and I think that's right. Was there moments that where you saw them interacting where you first thought, "Oh, he totally looks up to her"? I think in the very end, like the very last scene. Oh, right when when he realizes that he's basically free and he's got like a family. Okay, that's fair. Do you think he would have changed his mind if she didn't? provide that evidence for him that Mago has actually got a whole bunch of money and he's just taking advantage of everybody. Do you think he still would have changed his mind? No. I, I'm not sure hmm. either. What, Greg, what do you think? I mean, the emotional aspect, he keeps saying, you know, I'm good. I've got a, it's like, you know, it's a classic 
you know, I can't think of the word. What is the word? But um, there's definitely, it's definitely an unhealthy, toxic relationship. It's an abusive relationship. I think that's the word I was looking for. Ray keeps saying, no, I can, I can show him. I can get him to care about me. Uh, I really want, and I need his approval. And all he is doing is, is sucking them dry uh, with the way he takes advantage of them and their labor and their affections for him when really he just wants to use them to his heart's content. He treats them like they're less than individuals. So I don't think, uh, even though he really does appreciate Omega, I think that grip and that toxic thing is buried so deeply in all their psyches that if not for hard, cold evidence, facts, I don't know that he would have turned. I'll only add this as maybe a slight pushback, but Please, because yeah. of what you said, you know, he has that relationship, right? He's got that on that and everybody is just so, you know, so wired for that, that when Omega just hands over her rations to him, mm -hmm. I think that act really was a tipping point. I, I don't think you can have that turn. The evidence I do think is clear. But I do think that just, you know, because you see it in the beginning when he sees the rations, he's eating, he's going to eat that ration that's on the floor of the Marauder. And that payback, you know, the payback, the payoff later when Omega just freely gives it to her. And he, he's also seen her do, you know, like, you know, she's she's been kind of feeding this whole time that I think that act really does kind of is, is a tipping point. Um, I love but, that. And I didn't think about that. And of course, uh, the act of sharing food and sharing a meal together is such an an intimate, important act, uh, a, a sign of love. And he never offers food to them or they have to fight for it. Or she just like, oh, here you can have mine. And he just is eating it. He doesn't gorge it either, by the way. He just eats it. <laughs> he savors it. Uh, and he's just sort of thrown by the whole thing. So, the, okay, I, I think I'm persuaded. I, I like that. I, I want it to be wrong. And so I'm very grateful for that perspective. Uh, the main thing I want to bring up, besides how much I can't say Mako, which I think I've made very clear <laughs> is um, I, I just like, I like the, uh, first of all, the, this, this is not super important, but when they're playing that little game that looks like dominoes, I don't know. It's like some sort of a space slash Sabaki version of dominoes. I thought of <laughs> you, Greg, and I thought of Tom Gross because, Oh, this is something they're going to absolutely love. There are little other developments too. Wrecker continues to be afraid of heights, but I mean, by this point, is he afraid of heights? I mean, I, I take insult as a person who's definitely afraid of heights. I couldn't go any of those places that he could go and he just kind of groans, but he is fighting, absolutely fighting through it. There is a great action sequence when they first, when they ambushed Benny, I know Mason, you, you mm -hmm. really liked that part too. I thought that was super cool. You want to talk about that, Mace? Um, there's another part I think we're talking about. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's when Drake helps Benny at the end when Mako's trying to pull him. Because when, like you said, when they're playing that space dominoes yes. thing, um, they don't even really talk to each other except, I think I'm going to win. No, I am. Mm -hmm. And then they team up because they realize that we why are we fighting against each other, which is a really, yeah. really nice thing. Uh, besides that ambush, I think the the scene where Hunter descends down into that um, tunnel, so tube, exhaust, whatever. <laughs> uh, my Star Wars plumbing is a little rusty. <laughs> they, uh, they they have a minute, and I didn't time it out. Oh, Mason, you're usually pretty good about timing stuff like that out. I, it probably was about a minute or so. It wasn't a minute. I know that. It was like <laughs> 25 seconds. But... Well, okay. Well, either way, we'll, we'll, we can prove that one later. But I, I think that's an excellent sequence. Uh, and I think it's nice to see Hunter in action because we don't really see a ton of that recently. So I, it, for me, just as a as a fan of Star Wars in action, I, I really enjoyed that moment. That was one of my favorite scenes. Any other sequences we want to talk about? I don't feel like there's a ton to pour over in this one, honestly, uh, because I think the important thing to note uh, is, again, the effect that Omega has just by being herself. She's never preachy. She's never judgmental. She just, she has her family. She knows what she needs to do. She and Hunter work so well together. He seems to be far, far removed from angsting over her. He, he trusts her like a, like a fellow member of Clone Force 99. And I think that's really, really nice to see. And I like the idea of, well, well, at one point, Tech points out, you know, Mago uses power and means to gain leverage. 
similar to the Empire, but on a much smaller scale. And then they have this moment where Omega is, is very concerned. There's so many people besides the Empire that are nasty. And then, amazingly, Tech says, yeah, but there are a lot of people like us, too. Tech being the pathos. Love that. I'm so happy you brought that up because I, I went back through and I was writing that quote down. And, you know, something, once again, going back to that, not seeing that on a big screen, he flashes that little grin at the end. And yes. that was such a payoff for that last episode where they have that they have that moment together. And, you know, even, you know, tying back Hunter's you know, relationship with Omega Wrecker's kind of still moaning a bit about heights, but kind of getting over it. You're seeing this little growth. And, you know, unfortunately, like I said, you know, a lot of times we have to, you know, we're slipping in this, you know, viewing, you know, during lunch or something, we're taking our mobile phone and we're really missing out on a lot of these little moments that, you know, as we're seeing the pacing of this entire season, you know, it, it's, we're, we're missing it. And so, you know, it's great that these episodes are short, you know, they are, they are, you know, fairly, you know, straightforward, but there's, there's these, there's these little bits they're putting in going back and listening to, you know, uh, you know, Kiner's music, especially at the end as, you know, as Omega is kind of being saved by Hunter and, you know, that, that trust that they had, that she knew exactly what he was going to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't seem now that a lot of those things you're, you're, you're not unexpected. They're just working together. It's just these, the engines just going like it's getting greased really well. And, yes. you know, although it could seem like it's moving slow, you know, um, it, it's just really nice to kind of see this. And you know, I, I was also just happy Benny's chase at the beginning was short because I was like, you know, at this point, like, all right, th that's sort of like yes. my, my, my reward for like, I understand what you're going to do, but it's nice that I don't necessarily need this to go on for many minutes. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. I, I also felt, um, chase fatigue so i was glad not to have to to see that as well this is vanessa marshall and you're listening to coffee with kenobi oh uh, gosh amazing anything you want to add that are on your notes that we haven't talked about yet nothing nothing not at all. <laughs> greg what about you um, we kind of mentioned this a little bit, but, you know, I did like Tech's appraisal of the workers' condition, and I think that's something else kind of leading back into that they are noticing that, you know, that, that people are being oppressed across the galaxy. And I think these, these lines are really nice because they're just adding up. Um, and I, the only other thing I would say, you know, as much as you hate uh, Mako, uh, Jonathan I think it's, is it LaPau or LaPo who did the voice for it? I had to read was also the voice of Gunji. So if we wanted to kind of, no you know, a little bit of, a, a little bit of, you know, sugar with the urine as it will, for lack of a better one, I would say <laughs> that you could take away that he was also a voice of a character now we, you know, that's, that we loved seeing. So, oh, um, yes. I mean, one, one redeeming feature shares a common voice. Amen. Well, I mean, and, you know, this is all. <laughs> The, the performance is great, and that's one of the reasons why it's so impactful. And he's obviously supposed to be a, a really nasty character, and mission accomplished. The only thing we didn't really talk about is, uh, yes, Kiner's music, a special shout-out to my CWK Live uh, friends who join us every week because they've been talking about Kiner's music every time we do our top fives. And this is no exception. It's really noticeable on that bridge that very much reads like the Temple of doom bridge and mm. even some of the music as they're slowly marching across we've seen a lot of indiana jones homages in season two of the bad batch and i am absolutely here for something like that so i guess let's give our letter grades and if you want to explain them go ahead mason the floor is yours fractions eight or a and five tenths <laughs> and a and five tenths or a and one half okay an A and a half. Mm. Uh, you're you're killing me with these um, these these crazy equations. Tell me why. Um, fractions because of math. Yes. And <laughs> I mean, it wasn't the Super Bowl like I said last week, but I like the episode overall. Okay, so is an A and a, a half is that like an A plus plus, or is it just under an A plus? It's under an A plus. It's halfway to an A plus. Okay. From that... an A. That helps my English teacher brain make sense of that. Thank you. Uh, Greg, what about you? Uh, well, for one, you know, just just as an aside before we, you know, I, as we're kind of 
you know, winding things down. I did want to say uh, I'm going to give Mason an A because I would say that, you know, listening to you over this season, as we have, you know, we got to see you at Steam and the Star Wars Live, you know, doing it. And then from now, it's really fun to watch you grow as a as a podcaster. And I think Dan needs to put you to use more often, especially with a lot of shows coming up. So I would just say um, I, I love coming back week after week. And I love the theme of the shows. You know, you're bringing in a lot of different folks and, you know, some family folks as well. Uh, it was just kind of fun because I think it matches this this relationship with the Bad Batch so well. So th th there's going to be my, my grade for Mason. Um, as far as the grade for the show, I was going with a solid B, but I would say on that second viewing, seeing Tech, uh, seeing Tech and Omega again, uh, I'm going to give it my B plus. That that's, that plus is specifically for a little bit of a grin, uh, just because if if you love Tech, and I know uh, you know our mutual friend Frank Mulder is a huge Tech fan. Shout yes. out, um, you know it, it, you've had you've had a, a multitude of you know uh, of plenty. Uh, this season with text. So I would just say that alone, I think these little, these little bits and bobs that they've added to it, uh, B plus in my book. Very good. And thank you for your uh, awesome words about Mace. Um, that is very good. And and now I will always remember this episode is the one where Mason hired Greg as his agent. And it's a very, <laughs> very good choice. A very Call good me. choice. Call me. <laughs> I would give this episode, I'm going to split it up on my rubric. Uh, I think the first half of the episode is a B minus. Uh, the second half of the episode is an A minus. So I'm going to combine them mm. to a nice solid B. A nice solid B. It uh, it has some great character stuff, as you said. We we get to continue to enjoy the feast that is tech uh, in very nice organic ways. Nothing seems forced, and I really like the messages. Uh, that are present, and I and I always like redemption, especially in in a good Star Wars thing, and and seeing Benny start to realize that he has worth outside of what someone gives him, and once he realizes that he's being taken advantage of and used, he doesn't feel down on himself. He empowers himself, and that is something that he has sorely needed. So I really really like that message quite a bit. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both, uh, of course, for joining me on Coffee with Kenobi this week to talk about retrieval. Looking forward to sharing all of your top fives next Tuesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. In the meantime, you can find Mason um, cruising through the stars uh, with Patrick Mahomes. Looking forward to the next NFL season. Uh, <laughs> is that right, Mace? Oh, look at he's got the look at that chief scare. Nice. That's right. And Greg, please let everybody know what's going on with Thrill Base Card and what you've got going on. Well, thank you. Um, it's been fun going over the uh, the the Bad Batch uh, with my with my partner in crime, Greg Cass. From Ion Cannon, we had yes. Jen uh, Subchakchai, who did the, who did all those Willow episodes with you. Uh, they were both in town last week. It was really fun to do the show in person. Uh, but we're going to finish out and somehow had to figure out how to squeeze in uh, the Mandalorian as well. Although that it's going to keep me up nights. Um, on the card side, you know, I think we got some nice shows coming up. Be talking to uh, some other card folks. You know, Ian Taylor from the Marvel Card Collectors Podcast as well as hopefully getting um, Mark Newbolt on. Cross your fingers. And one of the reasons I wasn't in the uh, the CWK live chat was uh, John and Mary Jo Tenuto was doing a really interesting library uh, presentation on, you know, Star Wars, you know, in print. And they have a book coming out this summer that's going to talk about the radio dramas, the Star Wars radio dramas of the original trilogy. And I am this close, I think, of, of getting them on. And I know they're making the podcast rounds, but I'm I'm real excited about that and some of these shows. And um, it, it's going to be fun. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. You know this all too well. We all kind of like you know keep an eye on what you're doing and how you're staying on top of things. But uh, it's fun having having a great time. Well, it's I love to hear it, uh, and again, love hearing you and Greg and when Jen is on to the this. It's just magic. You're just you're three wonderful members of the community, and I can't thank you enough for not only being on the show and supporting you, but being so awesome to Mace too. 
<laughs> Mace is a baller man. Don't do not do not take him lightly. That's right. He will take your cards if you're not if you're not careful <laughs> with those with those trades he used to do mm-hmm. a couple summers ago. Well, thank you again, Greg and Mason, on behalf of myself. We will see you next week. Get your top five list ready to join me next Tuesday night. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 